we are going to have our lunchtime keynote come and talk to you guys. It's going to be amazing and dynamic. But first, I would like to introduce uh, Nadine Thompson, who will be introducing our uh, lunchtime keynote. So uh, Nadine, I'm not sure where. Oh, so I'm sorry. Nadine. Nadine, she has a wonderful brand called Soul, Soul Purpose. And let me tell you something. I really love this brand because it's like the body butters with like the the perfumes and their aromas. I smell so good. I look so good. Girls like, yo, you so fresh. I'm like, yeah, soul purpose. <laughs> Buy some. <laughs> I'll bill you later for the ad that I just did. All right. <laughs> Sherry's been spending her money on that boy. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's really nice to be here. I'm really honored to be here and energized last night by the speech by Dr. Kendi. I went home just thinking about everything he said and was so inspired um, by everything. Um, Again, my name is Nadine Thompson. I'm the owner of a company called Soul Purpose. Uh, we are committed to empowering women to care for themselves and to create the lifestyle and wealth that they need in their lives. I'm also a full-time psychotherapist with a company called Better Help. We're very committed towards mental health and helping people to live stronger, healthier lives. I'm proud to be married to Reverend Robert Thompson <laughs> the favorite <laughs> of the two. We have two children, Camilla and Isaiah, seven grandchildren. Yes, yes, they missed a memo on birth control at our house. <laughs> um, Marcus, Cairo, Jade, Kyrie, Noah, Trey, and two-month-old Ava. And we have two new additions to our family, Soren and B, who are just moved in. So we have a very full house and we're really happy to have them here with us as they start their lives in New Hampshire. I invited them to come today and they asked if there was gonna be food and that was the deciding factor <laughs> for them to show up. Our keynote speaker today, um, a wonderful and handsome young man, Theo Wilson. Uh, he began his speaking career in the NAACP at the age of 15 and has always had a passion for social justice. Theo is now the executive director of Shop Talk Live, Inc. The organization uses the barbershop as a staging ground for community dialogue and healing. He published his first book in 2017, the Law of Action. Uh, Theo graduated, he hails from Denver, Colorado. He's a proud graduate of FAMU, Florida A&M University. His father is a Vietnam vet and his mother is somebody I would have probably admired. She a, was a fashion model with Essence Magazine back in the day. Um, <clears throat> He has a TV show on the History Channel called I Was There. And one of the things that I'm really excited about and envious about is he's also um, an author. He uh, performed on TED Talk. He did a TED Talk, um, go, uh, and it's called Goes Where He Goes Undercover in the Alt-Right with 17 million views on TED. So that alone is just really incredible. Um, that show is still available on TED Talk and you can listen to it. He also has a wonderful family, wife Dora, two, daughter, two daughters, Amora and Jamila, and they um, live in Aurora, Colorado. Um, again, the book, the name of this book, which is not here today, but you can get on Amazon is called the law of action. So let's all welcome Theo Wilson.
Hey. How y'all doing? So y'all going to put me on the stage with the people in my bibliography today, praise God. Y'all done say, yo, we got Ibram X. Kendi. I was like, oh, really? The Ibram X. Kendi, okay. Yeah, Rothstein's going to be here. Oh, the dude who wrote the book, I'm quoting. No pressure. All right. Uh, to say that I'm humbled to be here is accurate speech. A lot of people say, I'm humbled to be here. No, I'm humbled to be here. You all are doing great work. I literally have admired you from afar. And it's good to see you in person here. Uh, it's good to see any, anybody in person these days. But um, I would just like to get into what I'm here to talk about today, the receipts of racism. Somebody said, bring me the receipts. Bring me the receipts. There is a cost to all of this discrimination and whatnot. And a lot of folks who have spoken here today and perhaps yesterday, there will be some overlap, but I promise you there are some unique things that I'm going to go over with you today. Um, it's been six years since I jeopardized my mental health going undercover in the alt-right online. Uh, somebody would probably ask, so why would a black dude create a fake profile as a white supremacist uh, for eight months and try to figure out stuff that uh, you could have read in any history book. Well, the thing about it is I'm a police brutality survivor. When I was 22 years old, I was handcuffed to a chair and beaten by Denver police until I begged for my life. Eight years after that, my friend Alonzo Ashley was killed by the Denver police tased to death at the Denver Zoo. So I have a stake in this. When folks say Black Lives Matter, it hit different for somebody like me. Um, with all the things that have been accomplished in my life since then, I realized that there is survivor's guilt in having walked away from that chair. Every time I see a brother having lost his life at the hands of those who are paid to serve and protect, right? And so um, when I went undercover, it was about not some kind of uh, investigation into like, well, what is the emotional drivers for white supremacists, even though I found those when I did a talk about it. This was reconnaissance for me. This was investigating something that objectively already threatened my life, right? But what's interesting about this investigation is I began to talk about this across the country is that interpersonal racism is but one kind. It is one face of this dragon, right? It's the personal feelings. I got to break this down to y'all. Y'all already know you have you written books about it, but it's literally about interpersonal feelings of bigotry and hatred towards other groups of people, prejudice, right? Interpersonal is but one face of it. I call it the three eyes of racism. Next one, of course, is institutional. Don't leave no N-word, no swastika spray paint on the wall. You see it on the back end in the data. And that's what we're going to investigate today. And of course, the third one is internalized racism. When the abused begin to see themselves through their eyes of, the, of their abusers, right? But the fact is, is that when you talk about the receipts of racism, you're talking about the institutional face of it, right? And the issue is that when people have tried to address this before in dialogue with people who this affects, specifically on class lines, when you tell a colorblind story, there is some traction at first because the truth is, is that race and class have been linked in this country, but there are similar class interests across color lines. What happens? The colorblind story of uplift financially in this country falls prey to the dog whistle story. The dog whistle story about who's worthy of participation in the American dream, about who are the lazy freeloaders versus who are the hardworking Americans. As Lindsey Graham let us know, uh, uh, Americans is a loaded word in the subconscious of a lot of folks in his Freudian slip when he talked about there are black people and Americans as well. You know, so 
The colorblind story sadly tends to be blind to racism and not race. And in order to take a real stab at fixing this thing, um, we got to look at the landscape of iniquity and dream of policies that can remedy it. But first, we got to take a clear eyed view of what we're actually looking at. One of my martial arts instructors, I mentioned this in my book, The Law of Action, which I don't have here today, um, which you can buy on Amazon. But my instructor told me the most powerful weapon any warrior can have is an accurate assessment of the situation. Not better, not worse, but accurately. Because before a gun, knife, or nuclear bomb, it will let you know what tool to use effectively to neutralize the threat. We have to have an accurate assessment of the situation that we have before us, right? And so when I did this undercover experiment that led to this entire investigation of the true roots of this resurgent racism in America, or at least the resurgentness of its face, I was working at a job, y'all. I was at a call center. I was at a call center taking calls for this group called the College for Financial Planning. I was the only brother in the organization, which to their credit, was the first time that my blackness and maleness had been interpreted in a positive light, right? The depth of my voice was seen as threatening before. So these folks are like, oh, do you do voiceover work? It's amazing. <laughs> my physicality, I have been a combat athlete. I was a track star, right? That Jamaican black, oh, I love my, you know, but, um. Yeah, like that was interpreted as not threatening, but like, wow, what's your workout routine, right? So th these were good folks that I wanted to work with. They were kind, right? But in this, I was working there during the time where brothers was getting killed on Facebook. You know what I'm talking about, when the videos would just roll without a filter, right? And I wanted to call in black. Y'all ever wanted to call in black? I can't make it in today. I'm triggered. My ancestors are talking to me. They said, get some rest because we couldn't. Right? I couldn't call in black because I couldn't afford to. The question is, why was I looking for a job in the first place? Now, as I mentioned on my show on History Channel, my show on History Channel, <laughs> I was there, right? And I made sure that they, they, they ran this. My grandfather, uh, was a Tuskegee Airman. I'm the grandson of a red tail, for real. Um, his name was Theobald, oh God. I didn't do it, it was him. <laughs> but his name was Theobald Wilson, <clears throat> pardon me. Theobald George Constantine Emanuel Wilson. Uh, first generation Jamaican immigrant, right? And he was an American hero legit. Right? The thing about it is that had he not lived to his 80s, he would not have the slightest chance to enjoy any of the accolades that came to him. Like many Black veterans, they didn't get their flowers when it mattered the most. When did it matter the most? When he came back. This man, who had just beat Hitler, <laughs> basically, right? came back and the only job that he could get was as a book binder. This man had multiple skills that he had learned. He also worked with his hands before he went into the military. He was raised during the Great Depression. He could do it all, book binder. That was what he could get. Which led to a situation that cascaded generational poverty that I didn't even understand that I was recovering from, right? Because when my father was born, he could not get the house that he probably could have got had he been white. And had he been white, the house that he could have got in New York City would be worth multiple millions of dollars today. But instead, my father was raised in the projects of Brooklyn. My father, right? My father was a street cat. He was a gang member. He also tried to improve his life by joining Malcolm X's organization after he left the Nation of Islam. 
Malcolm was assassinated the same year that my father was drafted into Vietnam. Now he drafted, right? Had my father been able to access some kind of wealth, perhaps he would have been able to get the studying help he needed to be better in school. He might have been in college and could perhaps have gotten a deferment from Vietnam as a student. Instead, my father was subject to Agent Orange poisoning and a whole helping of PTSD which showed up in my household frequently. Not his fault. He did take the responsibility, however, of doing his own unearthment of his own mental health, right? But that didn't show up in our wallet for a minute, okay? I was looking for a job because I did not have the generational wealth that I should have had, right? And so what we see is that this ain't a unique story. Black folks were kept out of the New Deal reforms. Roosevelt was called a socialist for that, for saving capitalism. He was called a socialist, right? But the thing about these New Deal reforms was that they largely left out the professions that Black folks worked in, mainly domestics and agricultural workers. That's like 61% of our workforce back in those days, right? We talk about racially redlined communities where, properly, where property could not appreciate so much conservative finger pointing goes into Chicago. What about Chicago? Don't tell me Black Lives Matter until you fix that gang problem in Chicago. Well, or, uh, you're going to address this contract buyers thing that happened in Chicago that had their properties depreciate and lock them into cycles of poverty, which we knew could lead to violence since the Irish were languishing in ghettos. Did you do anything about that, right? The ghetto in and of itself is an engineered condition. Nelson Mandela said that poverty is as engineered a condition as slavery. We've known this leads to violence, and yet no personal responsibility for that. Moving on, right? Excluded from federally subsidized suburbs that could have helped us out. The Homestead Act of 1862, we went into that. But before that, race codified into law as early as 1790 with the Naturalization Act, said only people accepted as white could be citizens. That caused something, that caused something. These exclusionary policies could be seen as oppression. You know what else they could be seen as? Whites only affirmative action. Yeah, these are entitlement programs. You know what slaves did? My enslaved ancestors, they gave the white community universal basic income for 200 plus years. That's what that is, right? That is an entitlement program. Slavery, as our brother Sean Rochester pointed out, is a 100% tax on your labor. 100% tax, right? And even after we move past the civil rights movement, we find that the black-white employment gap amounts to about $3.3 trillion in lost wages. Okay, let's break this down because we're gonna do some numbers here. And in order to do these numbers, I have to address a fault in the human brain itself. Human brains don't do good with big numbers. Our brains are like evolved to like problem solve and survive, but big numbers are tough for us. So we are gonna break down the difference before I go any further between a million, billion, and trillion. Million seconds, how long is that? Million seconds. 12 days, 12 days is a million seconds. Estimating on 12 days being a million seconds, how long is a billion seconds? Billion seconds, 33 years, 33 years. How long is a trillion seconds? Yeah, 33,000 years. A trillion seconds ago, we were contending with woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. A trillion seconds ago. Another way to break it down, our guy, Tony Robbins. I like Tony Robbins. He has an awesome jawline. Tony Robbins said, what is that? Hey, man, hello. <laughs> you know your words are powerful when it's knocking objects off. All right. <laughs> nah, I would hope, but here's the thing. Million dollars, hundred dollar bills can fit in a briefcase, a large one, but can do. Billion dollars, 
$100 bills about the size of a luxury sedan. Trillion dollars in $100 bills is the size of a city block and a building five stories tall. These are the numbers that we're going to be talking about today. So I'm trying to give y'all some visuals, okay? So when we say that after the civil rights movement, even the black-white employment gap has cost us $3.3 trillion, we are talking about three city blocks of $100 bills, five stories high. This is the money that we're missing in our community, right? Now, Sean Rochester went into the dentist. Didn't you say you know Sean Rochester? Dennis, where are you at? I'm, then it's like, yeah, I, I know Sean Rochester. I'm like, man, you know Sean Rochester. Tell him I said what's up. His book is fabulous. Now, Sean Rochester goes into why this is happening. The implicit association test from Harvard University, right, has been taken by over 3.5 million people. Now, if you know anything about scientific studies, that is a large sample size. You can publish a scientific study off of a sample size of 100 people. This has been taken 3.5 million times. According to Harvard University, don't get mad at me, talk to Harvard. 75% of Americans have an unconscious preference of white people over black people, unconsciously, at least, right? including the people who be like, I don't have a racist bone in my body. I'm like, but maybe it's in your cartilage, but <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> right? Even those folks, unconscious, they don't mean to have it, but that's just what happens when you're indoctrinated with American imagery for so darn long, right? This fact, Harvard University also said, is a factor in discrimination. This shows up in the numbers, right? How did we find this out? 2002, y'all might've heard about this, the resume study. Who, who remembers that resume study? Uh-huh, for those of you who don't, I'm gonna break it down to you real quick, right? White sounding names like Brandon and Emily. Brandon and Emily were put on the exact same resumes with black sounding names like Jamal and Lakeisha. Turns out Brandon and Emily are fictional resume applicants got 50% more callbacks than Jamal and Lakeisha on the exact same resume, right? Now, these callbacks increased by 30% with more experience. Everybody wants candidates with a depth of, you know, knowledge and time on the job and all that stuff, right? As they should, as they should. It took the black sounding name applicants over eight years of experience to overcome this gap. Same resume, right? And so this is uniform across industries they found at Harvard University, right? And that was actually University of Chicago who also backed up those findings. Black male doctors, if they make $65,000 less per year on average than their white counterparts, that adds up to a lifetime of around $3 million lost earnings. Could that individual doctor perhaps have used that to maybe, I don't know, create wealth, pass something on, make sure that your grandkids are set up in a certain way, right? Let's get into the real estate situation. Now, I don't know if y'all saw, who watches The Daily Show with Trevor Noah? God, I love that guy's accent. He's wonderful, right? So, and they actually ran this experiment, housing appraisal gap. Switching the race of the seller. How did they do that? Pictures, pictures. Those are some very valuable pictures, right? Housing, if you have pictures of black people, because that's the people who are selling the house, anywhere to be visibly seen by the appraiser, it turned out on average, you lost about 100 to 250K on the price of that house, right? This totals $4.8 trillion of lost housing wealth to the black community. When we talk about why we don't have what we need to pass this on, and we see that none of this is happening with folks throwing around the N word, willfully not liking who we are, saying mean things to us. All of this means that we're up against something that is invisible and hard to track. Institutional racism, 
Hard to spot on the front end. On the back end is where you see the data, right? So what's the overall aggregate cost of this? Well, Forbes magazine in 2017 published an article about what this actually means to the Black community. Forbes magazine says that by the year 2056, the entire Black community in America is set to have zero net worth. I repeat, zero net worth. Assets to liabilities, in aggregate, Black folks will have nothing by the year 2056. This was before the pandemic. This was before, as Forbes calculated, 41% of Black businesses shut down. Why? Because most of those businesses are sole proprietorships. Most of those businesses are hustles that got LLCs. Most of those businesses were founded despite the fact that people did not have generational wealth to start off their business to begin with. One of the greatest myths that I keep seeing people in success psychology circles talking about is that 80% of new millionaires are first generation. That's not inherited. But what you fail to mention, buddy, is that if your parents have, I don't know, $700,000, they're not technically millionaires, but they can lend you 80 grand to start your business. See what I'm saying? So even in the numbers, when it comes to up by your bootstraps, which I'm so glad sister acknowledged the straight absurdity of that statement. I didn't know that that was like a joke when it started, right? But it's facts. When you have the added value of assets that can be liquidated into wealth for your children that shows up in a real, real way, right? White median wealth, this was 2013, so I, I didn't know that it had changed as bad as Sister said, but literally it was a, like one in 13, one to 13 ratio, right? According to the Pew Research Foundation. Now this is what I try to explain this to people as, right? If you start a monopoly game, with half as much as your competitors. Who do you think is gonna pay $200 every time they pass go? Who, right? A fifth, don't even think about it. One tenth, come on, that's a joke, right? 10 times around the board before your competitor starts, 13 times around the board, this is insanity, right? And these same folks calculated that if white wealth did not increase one iota, it would take black wealth at its, well, before it started to recede, 12 years to catch up. 212 years. That's if white folks didn't get no wealthier, right? Why is this happening? It's because those who have wealth are accumulating interest on that wealth faster than the economy itself can expand. It's like having a lake versus a puddle. If you have a lake, if you have a reservoir, when it rains, you have rainfall that falls into it and it just gets bigger. If you have a puddle, guess what? It goes back into the sky. This is just simple science. This is common sense. This is the things that we can all see observably and the numbers are backing it up, right? Now, here's what's interesting because we've talked a lot about what discrimination costs the black community. But somebody, I know somebody liked the Bible in here. Somebody mentioned a little something. I like this scripture. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Racism costs white folk too. Oh, and it costs them dearly. In fact, racism costs white folks so much that the only reason why they cannot see it oftentimes is because they are so powerful, they don't see the forest for the trees. The sister, Heather McGee, wrote a book called The Sum of Us. That book should be required reading. It's what the actual toll of discrimination has taken on white America. And she found some very interesting things, right? Now, one of the things that happened with the Southern strategy, you remember the Southern strategy, when the Democrats and Republicans flipped on who was left and who was right? That was weird. <laughs> Can that happen again? Right? 
So I've heard a lot of Republican people. So, okay, this goes back to my experiment in, in the all right. A lot of them were like, yo, Republicans were the party of Frederick Douglass. I'm like, he wouldn't recognize y'all the thing. He wouldn't recognize none of the Trumpism y'all talking about, right? Don't claim Frederick Douglass. He wouldn't claim you, right? But the fact is, is that there was a, there was a flip with the Southern strategy. The disaffected white voters, super upset that black folks could actually participate in the system they were being taxed for started being vulnerable to dog whistle politics that were baiting them into the right now, which was slipping to the Republicans, right? With these little, should we say, symbols of who was worthy and who was not. We talked about that a little bit earlier. The freeloader trope, the roach, the welfare queen versus the hardworking American, right? Now, here's what's so interesting. In Republican circles, in conservatives, in the right wing, you hear them talk about getting rid of big government, darn it. Governments and everything. Can't have that. It's un-American. We want small government. Well, what's interesting is that government was not perceived as the enemy in white America until 1964, <laughs> when Black folk could participate, right? So what was happening before then was that, according to Heather McGee's book, 70% of white Americans saw government as a necessity for a better life. They believed in what they call activist government. Government should ensure decent life, decent jobs, right? There were robust public programs that did not have to be filled by a nonprofit sector full of the money of the 1% anyway. Trying to do good, that ain't actually y'all job. What's supposed to happen is that what used to happen was that since we are all paying into the public pool, we all should be benefiting from it, right? That 70% of white people who believed that activist government was a necessity dropped to 35%. They cut that in half after the civil rights movement, right? And so what was behind this thinking? What is actually at work here? the zero-sum game ideology. For them to get, I must lose, and for me to get, they must lose. That's actually like, we never questioned that. We, ne we like, 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 it's like as big as the sky. We don't see it anymore. The zero-sum game ain't enough for everybody, right? Because when they believed that, there was a massive divestment from these public funds that ended up biting white folks in the bum bum. And here's how it looked, right? Number one, there was a huge problem with them investing in colleges. Now, who, who, who here got a little bit of that, uh, student debt stuff that Biden talking about trying to relieve $20,000 of? Like, thanks for taking away a fifth of what I got, brother. But all right. You know what I'm saying? Well, that wasn't a thing. Public colleges were a huge good that everybody understood you have to invest in in order to be competitive with the rest of the world. They understood this until Black folks could participate, right? Now, here's what's interesting. White communities are shouldering this debt broadly, though Black communities are shouldering it acutely. This pattern persists throughout the economy, right? What is such a big problem is they do not teach the other side of history when it comes to movements that we found out were morally right, right? And white folks don't get that information either. We've known that discrimination hurt white folks since the 1800s. There was a book written by a man named Hinton Rowan Helper, right? The Impending Crisis of the South came out in the year of our Lord, 1857. Hinton Rowan Helper did an assessment of the public goods of the North and the South, and he said, man, the North is outperforming the South, something crazy. He saw that the North had three to seven times the amount of public facilities, including libraries, including schools, you name it, roads completed, railroads, taken care of, shiny, polished, and new, right? The land in the North was worth five times as much as the land in the South, even though the Southern land had better mineral and growing conditions because of the weather. And he understood that poor white Southern men were less educated and had virtually no say-so in plantation and in plantation state politics. It hurt them. We knew it. 
And what he said was that the oligarchs of the lash must get rid of slavery in order to enfranchise white men. Hinton Rowan Helper was an avowed racist, like a scientific racist, the whole phrenology thing, that was him, right? But even then they understood that the rich folks in any society are going to allow themselves to be taxed in order to have the kind of public amenities necessary for their workforce and their clientele, right? When your workforce is free labor, living in plantation houses, you do not invest in anything that would make you uncomfortable beyond what you need to make money. That's it. So since they did not invest in a free population of labor and clientele, there was no need for the poor white guys to actually have their situation uplifted, but the poor white guy was still invested in it. Why? That old talisman of whiteness Tana Hasey Coates talks about. At least I'm better than the psychological phenomenon of last place aversion is real. And what they found is that, let's say there's a five-tiered class system in an experimental setting, right? Everybody who is in the higher rungs of these five tiers, one to three, has no problem giving to those from uh, the bottom of the spectrum of this hypothetical class system. It's tier four that where it gets interesting. Tier four of the five, they get mad stingy with what they got because the fear of last place makes sure that they do not invest in giving to anybody lower than them because they do not want to become lower than them. That is what the psychological phenomenon that we're seeing in poor white America, even though they have class commonality with poor black America, right? What I found in this book was a huge list of the ways that white folks have been harmed by their own racism, right? We talked about the college tuition, but here's what's interesting. The divestment in public infrastructure is why we can't have nice things here, right? Anybody who's traveled to, I don't know, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Japan, they notice something. Boy, these rail systems are nice. Boy, this time off is great. How about that maternity leave? Huh? How about all that cool stuff that they have over there in the Nordic countries? That's socialism. Okay. Socialism versus capitalism is such an outdated debate. We all know that the people who live in hybrid systems have the longest life expectancy, the highest amounts of joy, lowest rates of suicide. We know that. We know that. But the fact that that news is kept out of the American populace and specifically the right wing means we don't know what we're missing. Oh, free healthcare having folks. Oh, public option. Don't got to go broke because you broke your leg. How about that, right? We can't have nice things because this country is invested in keeping fellow Americans down and those countries are not invested in keeping their countrymen down. We found that white folks don't got no problem with socialism as long as only white folks benefit. Soon as black folks, and we see this across the pond in Europe as well. What do you think drove Blexit? What do you think that was? Now, he was a horrible guy, but Muammar Gaddafi warned of this. He said, y'all keep on bombing us and watch what happens. If y'all depose me, this was the Arab Spring 2011. He told the United Nations, you destroy Libya, Europe will turn black. Right? So what happened was, see, what had happened was NATO had intervened and um, NATO had sent people in there to, like, knock over Gaddafi. NATO was known as the cork of Africa. All of that instability caused by centuries of colonialism was kept in check by a powerful nation state that would not let them cross the Strait of Gibraltar. Now all these black folks going to Europe. Now all these people who we bombed in, uh, what was that? The Iraq war, Operation Iraqi Freedom, where we were fighting terrorists and Al Qaeda. You remember that dude? Is our children learning? Remember that dude? Yeah, that guy. That wasn't 1950 or 1850. That was 2003 and beyond, right? I love him, but Obama, your drone program, I love you, brother, but that drone program, 
Yeah. When people cannot live safely in their own place, they're coming to yours. Right? Same thing happened. Y'all mad at these Mexicans and Venezuelans coming in from the bottom. Maybe we shouldn't have destabilized our governments. Maybe we shouldn't have toppled democracies and turning them to banana republics. Maybe. You see that blowback, white America? You see that? One of the things that was so interesting was the collapse of 2008. Now, our good brother Dennis mentioned that, right? Collapse of 2008. That's interesting because that subprime mortgage crisis began in Black communities. You see, in the late 1990s, organizations like Chase Mortgage Brokers, which lost a class action lawsuit from 1,000 families, were trying out these darn mortgage default what was that, those, those, those subprime situations where people who were more qualified were being willfully steered into refinance loans, even though their credit was technically too high for it, right? They were being tried out in Black communities first. First. Now, here's what had happened was, what had happened was Bill Clinton, remember that guy? I won't do his impersonation, y'all grown. But what happened was, when he left office, he repealed the Glass-Steagall Act. When Bill Clinton repealed the Glass-Steagall Act, this deregulates the market. Now, these toxic instruments that they were trying out in the Black community end up going, flooding the white market, right? Now, they're not just subprime. The rich man or middle-class man's subprime mortgage was known as an option arm. Now we have option arms flooding the market. And these organizations have been trying and testing them. Oh my gosh, right? Took about eight years. Took about eight years. But this thing that began in Black American communities under the radar cost this country $19 trillion in home equity. That's just America alone. What they don't talk about is that we lost as many people to suicide as we lost in the Iraq war because of this. You see what I'm saying? So when we talk about when we create equity, when we talk about what it takes in order to be a country that is actually pursuing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, there is no one above others. Every anti-racist act is an invitation two white people to come back into the human family. You can either be supreme or with us, but you can't have both. And actually, supremacy is based on acts that dehumanize you, putting you beneath the human family because you behaved inhumanely. And it's costing you to, I will leave with this, Citigroup, actually did a study of just what anti-Black racism, we ain't talking about what happens to Latinos, Asian Americans, Arab Americans, nothing like that. Just anti-Black racism, Citigroup released a study and said the cumulative effect of this for the last two decades has cost us $16 trillion. Holding down your fellow countrymen. They just did the report about our national debt. We had 31 trillion right now. You think we could have used this 16 trillion that came from just hurting black folks? I think we could have. All of this says to me one major thing, right? And I see, brother said I was over time. Can I just make one more point? Can I just make one more point? Okay, so I'm gonna say the R word, reparations as loud as I possibly can. And here's why. We have to reckon with the fact that this has been a kleptocracy from the beginning. My grandfather told me that America was a country always at war because America is a war disguised as a country. When you look at our activities, when you look at our military spending budget, you see people who are profiting from destroying other people the way that they destroyed the indigenous of this land. Our best weapons are Black Hawk, Tomahawk, Comanche, Apache. Do you understand what's going on in the psychology here? When we talk about what it really costs America, the biggest receipt of racism is what it costs whites to not be great. 
because you're comparing yourself to a severely depressed black population. Sure, you're leading the statistics about heart health and all that good stuff and education outcomes, but that is in comparison to people with a boot on their neck. You take that boot off and you can actually walk into your humanity. Why wouldn't you want that? You need to know what it's actually costing you because we for everybody is a dream that can still happen, but you must reckon with that past by going toward the future, repairing what you have broken. This invitation back into humanity has a price tag, and when you're willing to pay it, this dream can be real. My name is Theo E.J. Wilson, holla back. Thank you so much, Theo. That was really wonderful and every bit as good as last night. Every bit as good. <laughs> I could only think of two things to sum it up. One thing that I'm going to take away. Yeah, we're going to do the Q&A. Want to do that first? Okay. I'll sum up and then I, because I've only got two things to sum up and then I turn it over to Terry. Every anti-racist act puts us back into the human family. I thought that was so powerful. And then the invitation to let us walk into humanity together. I thought that was a really good way to end and to take away questions. And do you have any questions? Thanks. Um, so my question is, in 1989, Chuck D said hip hop is the CNN of the ghetto, right? This year uh, in New York State, they're using drill lyrics in court against these youngsters, right? And so you mentioned, you know, black on black crime and how people want to throw those things in, you know, into the into the mix about why things don't work and what are you going to do about this before you talk about that? Um, what would you say about the the, the importance? the significance, you know, the reason why um, we don't want to allow rap lyrics in court and why we also at the same time, I mean, you might not agree with this, but, you know, the kid's going to rap, right? They're going to do the thing. They're going to talk about what they're going to talk about. So I guess my question is twofold. One, what do you think of the current situation criminalizing rap lyrics? And then secondly, um, in the scope of self-harm and People talk about black on black crime, like where does drill and gangster rap and those kinds of things fit into that conversation? You're in luck, you're talking to a former rapper. I used to think I spit bars. Listen, so there's two things that are going on at the same time, right? On one hand, the rap industry is decidedly toxic. That's why I stopped pursuing it. I didn't want to be lyrically a destroyer. There is, of course, a part that we play in the messaging that goes to our vulnerable community. Anybody who don't think that rap affects kids' brain, just go to the hood and listen to the playground. And what happens is that in the absence of a powerful parental figure, these kids adopt the persona of their favorite entertainer. I took this girl who was fighting into our office. I was working at this after-school program called City Wild. And she literally quoted a Nicki Minaj lyric, 100 MFs can't tell me nothing. I was like, oh, no. So on one hand, there's that. On the other hand, there's a situation whereby rap was corrupted willfully by corporate interests where they were marketing to 70% white audiences that would have bought those toxic lyrics regardless. Now. As long as we're making people complicit, we need to talk about these record industries that are actually making money from, from signing these guys, right? Because there has, been in, there has been a reported collusion between them and private prisons for a long time. The fact that you have a situation whereby private prisons are leasing these facilities from the government that have to fill the beds, like they have to fill the beds, right? And that as long as we're putting folks in jail for rap lyrics, we need to go ahead and investigate conflicts of interest with record companies. 
We need to go ahead and investigate conflicts of interest when it comes to who is promoting these platforms, like, like perhaps YouTube. You see what I'm saying? Like, let's say these rappers are having private uh, 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 platforms that are pushing them out, right? But at the same time, black communities have been trying to fight this for a long time. One thing that I do not allow in discussions of black on black crime, which is really horizontal murder, everybody does it well. Like 80% of white people who are killed are killed by other white people. You don't hear me like, man, we got to do something about these fathers, right? The black community has been trying to address this for quite some time. We already know that mass incarceration is not the answer. If we're not looking at restorative justice for some of these young men, then we're going down a path that is too recent for us to repeat. And so I think that we need to look at all of these options, but restorative justice first, and let's look at the economic conditions that they come from as well. But there's a larger sphere of culpability than just drill rap, and we need to be honest about that. Any other questions? Do we have anything coming in on the chat? Gina? I hope that wasn't weird. Oh, this is, uh. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciated your remarks. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about the January 6th insurrection and how that relates to your commentary around, you know, racism isn't good for anyone and maybe the disillusionment of white folks that it's just kind of like, we can be oblivious to it because it's not really impacting us, but then it really is impacting us. So I'm just curious, it's like an open question, but you know, Bannon got four months. What, like what? <laughs> so anyway, I wanna hear your thoughts on um, the insurrection and maybe how that relates to your comments. January 6th, I was sitting there with my wife and I was like, somebody gonna die. What make you think you're gonna run up in this Capitol and everybody gonna come out alive? Did as many people die as would, ha would have happened if black people did that? No, but I knew someone was going to lose their life. The point is, Trump's base is also the most suicidal portion of the country. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Trump's base is non-high uh, school graduate, middle-aged white Americans. They're dying at wartime numbers because of opioids, first of all. I heard Tim Wise say, Trump is an opioid with a heartbeat. That's what he is, right? There's a self-destructive thing that's going on. And what's happening with white America right now and the American justice system is one of the problems with the very idea of whiteness. It can't hold itself accountable when the perpetrator has white skin. It's struggling right now. It's struggling. Number one, Trump's population of supporters is also the most armed group of the country. We also know that based on, uh, what was that, the Oath Keepers list that just got re released, there's like, 80, well, 38,000 people on the rolls of the Oath Keepers, and many of them are in law enforcement. So they're doing a calculus right now, and Trump knows this. They're doing a calculus. They're like, yo, so like, if we like really indict this dude, like, is something going to happen like that resembles Timothy McVeigh? See what I'm saying? The mutually assured destruction is the card that's being played right now. What we're dealing with is despair like we haven't seen in a long time in white America. Some of these white guys were correct in the fact that they're not going to have what their forebearers had. There was a big article in 2008 about the beast white male and whatnot, right? The beast white male, y'all know that? Okay, it was, it was weird. They showed like a white guy in a business suit washed up on the shore or whatever. But, this is God not being able to be mocked, in my opinion. This is the inevitable outcome of a culture that thinks violence will solve everything, including an election that they don't like. When I see Trump supporters, I see this election denial thing. I see a socially fabricated reality similar to white supremacy. Very, very similar. The mental exercise of Trump supporters not acknowledging the election is very similar to the mental exercise of Jim Crow. The echo chamber effects, social checkpoints, I'm not, if we don't have to acknowledge this reality, then we won't. 
and we'll back it up with force. Eventually, I, it's, it's really sad to, to, to say this, but like we're actually on the spectrum of sliding away from democracy. There is a thing called democratic backsliding and we're so there. The brother um, Malcolm Nance, y'all know Malcolm Nance? Malcolm Nance wrote a book called, and he wrote it out, They're Trying to Kill Americans. He sees the Trumpism as an insurgency. And the only way to stop it is to hold them accountable like you would anybody else. And if we struggle to do that, uh, we will watch the balkanization of America, unfortunately. And I had to grapple with that reality as a new father. Uh, thank you so much um, for your comments. I think the reason, at least in my point of view, that we all didn't have a lot of questions right away is because what you gave us was this amazing wall of ideas and thoughts that I'll be thinking about for a long time. So thank you. Uh, I also was, uh, was really struck by the Heather McGee reference you made in, the, in this last place aversion. Uh, and having done the work that you did, uh, where you looked really into your, your, your study of, of those folks who also are, who are now sort of below the last place, um, do you feel like there is any way that that last place aversion ever resolves itself? I mean, she, she draws a parallel from the very beginning to that. This is the thought I was having that was similar to that. Last place aversion is all based on zero sum thinking, all of it. What's gonna have to happen, and I think that the climate crisis may end up forcing this, is we have to reassess resources as human beings and not the things that human beings create as valuable, right? Even gold is worthless without other people. We will probably be forced as the waters rise, as the animals go extinct, to refigure what it's going to take to save this planet. And I believe that that sadly will be the only thing powerful enough to checkmate us out of an economic system that creates lack for the profit of others. And that's just a sad thing. I will say this too. White supremacy in terms of last place aversion had a reckoning in another country called Germany. What happened in Germany that did not happen in America was not just that Germany lost the war, was not just that it was humiliated before the world, was not just that it had to pay reparations to Jewish people, which it should have, by the way, very much so, is that Nazi Germany had to undergo a counter-propaganda denazification program for its population. We're talking about sitting in movie theaters, looking at as many movies on why Hitler was wrong as why you thought Hitler was right. And that only happens when you take a solid loss. And we're not talking about the loss that we took in Vietnam. My mama said, America need his ass whoop. Now what it means <laughs> is that me as a combat athlete and somebody who grew up fighting, there were certain lessons I didn't get until I woke up the next morning with the evidence. You understand what I'm saying? Certain consciousness are like that. Certain minds are like, certain spirits are like that. America ain't never had nobody put its knee in its back and said, let this go like Germany had. We need to undergo a literal denazification of the psychology of these folks here. And until that happens, you can see this stuff recurring and resurging again and again until we take that loss. And the only loss that empires as powerful as America actually take is the one that Rome took, a collapse from within. And that is sadly what it's looking like, but the universe is not mocked. Uh, uh, we also have a question from the chat now. We have a question from the chat now. Um, how can average white people wake up to their racism? Many black Americans say it's up to white people to change their own minds. How can that be done? Uh, thank you very much. So I get the sentiment, bro. You, well, I got to teach you black history. It's called Google. Find it yourself. This is the information age. You're only ignorant because you want to be. 
James Baldwin had another idea. Baldwin said, whether we want to or not, we teach in white folks about racism, whether we want to or not. So it's not, I, I disagree with the new stance. White folks just do your research. Now, you know what the emotional biases that certain folks have, and they do their own research. It's going to be bad. <laughs> Y'all have all seen very <laughs> misshapen efforts at this. And so I know we exhausted teaching them. Baldwin said, we actually, because of our position, are going to do it regardless. And so if you have the ba black folks, if you ain't got the bandwidth, I get it. If you ain't got the bandwidth, if, if you need a mental health day, mm -hmm. don't do it. <laughs> Chill. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Chill. But for those of us who do, I do this work because for whatever destiny reason, whatever reason I was incarnated at this time, it's part of what I came here to do to help mm -hmm. out. And I have no reason not to do it because my daughters is going figure out what this looked like anyway. I don't want them to have the same fight. Please, God, give them a new task, but not the one that we didn't succeed at accomplishing. And so we're going to teach anyway. And I think that Baldwin had it correct. If you have the bandwidth, do it wisely. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, your comments. You just hit so many things that I think are really important for us to understand. Um, we're not talking about politics too much in terms of what's happening in New Hampshire right now in this conference, but we have something called the Free State Project, and we have other groups in the state who are actively working on building the kind of MAGA agenda in a very quiet way. And I think it's important for people to understand that that's part of what we're fighting here in the state. And we're fighting around the country. Is this belief that there's a certain kind of predestiny that we don't need laws anymore, and we don't need schools anymore, and we don't need public health anymore. So I really appreciate you raising this up because we kind of don't know in the state that a quarter of our legislature is controlled by something like the Free State Project and other groups who work very quietly to undermine the work we're all doing here, and they're, they're very successful. That's why we have a divisive concept law in the state. That's why we have one of the best uh, school voucher programs in the country undermining public education. So I really just want to thank you for what you're saying and have us pay attention to this kind of insidious silent racism that's carried out by groups like the Free State Party and other groups who we don't know much about, but they do their work every single day. I work with an opposition intelligence group that watches these people, and they're bigger and much more dangerous than we would give them credit for. So. Hi. Okay, so first and foremost, that was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge, your experience. Uh, I believe everything happens for a reason, and I truly believe that listening to your speech was the reason why I was accepted into this this, this space. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to ask a question, though. So I, I know you talked a bit about reparations, but outside of reparations, what other structural changes do you think need to happen so that we're all valued as people and treated as such. Right. So uh, I appreciate that question. So there's an idea of targeted universalism, meaning you, we have an overall goal to lift up, let's say, where I live, o Aurora, Colorado, right? Uh, we need to increase uh, home ownership, let's say, right? Targeted universalism says we have a universal goal. Now let's target certain groups in order to reverse some of um, the inequity that's been put onto these groups. So there was a, there was a, a program by First Bank, uh, the Deerfield Loan, right? The Deerfield Loan was a very low interest loan that only black folks could apply for, for a down payment, you know? And First Bank went and did that. And of course, look, when you buy a house, you realize there's something that's gonna mess you over somewhere in the contract, in the five If you ever buy a house, you realize how little power we have over the banks, real, real, real talk. But in terms of the terms that I've seen in other places, this one really at least helped with what our lack of generational wealth 
not uh, didn't have us able to do, which is do a down payment, which meant uh, a large down payment, which reduces your overall mortgage payment. You see what I'm saying? Things like that. Now that lifts up all of Aurora. In order to fix structural raises, we have to see where the structure is and target certain populations based on their discrimination to create a universal outcome that is affecting the entire population, right? And so I think that there are other ex examples of this in education, right? There are examples of this when it comes to uh, school vouchers, all of this stuff, right? Being targeted with a population that has been harmed to create a universal outcome is one of the best ways that I can think about to actually see a real outcome. But first, that involves us seeing it. And sadly, there are people who are willfully not seeing it. But there's ways in order to duplicate these programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's our last question for the afternoon. Thank you so much again, Theo. It was really amazing.